Hello everyone, I'm Matt Mitrovich, the Alternate Historian. Those who follow me on social media may remember me complaining the other day about being asked whether white nationalist books were alternate history and whether I would ever review one. I can cheerfully say no to both questions. Instead, I will be reviewing Fire on the Mountain by Terry Bison. Fire on the Mountain is set in a timeline where Harriet Tubman joins John Brown in his 1859 raid on Harper's Ferry. Thanks to Tubman's sound tactical advice, Brown is successful in raiding the armory and takes his band of abolitionists into the mountains to harass the slavers in the region. As the Virginian and federal governments fail to capture Brown and his forces, it inspires slaves to rise up and encourages abolitionists to become more militant. As Brown's revolution spreads, foreign fighters arrive in America to join the fight, including Giuseppe Garibaldi. Mexico invades the southwest, and Haiti sends troops to support Brown as well. Instead of a civil war, America is racked by a revolution, where even the northern states balk at sending troops to help the South keep their slaves. In the end, the slaves win their freedom, and much of the South becomes a new nation of Nova Africa. This alternate history is told from the perspective of four different people. First, there is the journal of Dr. Abraham, who accounts his childhood memories of Brown's initial raid, and the subsequent events in a letter to his great-grandson. Then there are the letters of a liberal southern abolitionist doctor, who at first opposes Brown's violence, but soon becomes convinced it is the only way to free the slaves. Finally, there is the mother and daughter pair of Yasmin and Harriet from 1959. Yasmin is actually the great-granddaughter of Abraham, he never did get that great-grandson he wanted, and she's delivering his letter to the museum in Harper's Ferry dedicated to Brown and the Revolution. She is an unhappy character whose husband was an astronaut who died in space, and she is constantly reminded of this with the news of the upcoming manned Mars landing. I'll talk more about the alternate 1950s later, but right now I just want to point out that three out of the four point of view characters are black. More importantly, Terry Bison rarely makes a big deal out of this, especially for Yasmin and Harriet. Just something to think about. I may take some flack for saying this, but the initial changes to history in Fire on the Mountain are actually plausible. I could see a successful raid on Harper's Ferry and the mounting embarrassments as the government fails to capture Brown, inspire slave revolts throughout the South, and encourage abolitionists to become more militant. This could have led to northern states refusing to send their soldiers to die just so the South can keep their slaves, which could lead to the southern states seceding in response. Thus, the American Civil War is still a fight to keep the Union together, but the South would have to split their forces between the rebels and the Union armies. But would this mean we would see an African-American majority state in the South? Probably not. It should be mentioned that Brooks does give Brown and his allies every advantage, and some make more sense than others. Foreign fighters picking sides in the Civil War are nothing new. We saw that in the Spanish Civil War, and more recently in the Syrian Civil War. But Mexico invading the United States to retake the Southwest? Yeah, not happening. At the time of Harper's Ferry, Mexico was dealing with their own civil war, the Reform War, which lasted from 1857 to 1861. After that, they would have the French intervention in Mexico in 1861, which would see Maximilian I given the throne of Mexico before losing it in 1867, and thus inspiring Americans to get drunk on Cinco de Mayo. So Mexico would either be willing or able to help Brown and his men. There's also an odd moment near the end of the book where it's mentioned that Britain intervened against the revolutionaries and they almost lost the war because of it. It's honestly one of the more bizarre lines in the book. As many of you may know, Britain outlawed slavery in their empire by 1843, and while in our timeline there were many pro-Confederates in the British government, their support was more about knocking America down a peg and securing their supply of cotton, rather than keeping African Americans in chains. Maybe Bison was thinking the revolutionaries had it too easy and wanted to up the difficulty level, but it was really unnecessary. Of course, many would argue that the message of books like Fire on the Mountain is more important than the plausibility of its alternate history. Fair enough, but in my personal opinion, I feel you don't have to sacrifice the plausibility to get your message across. To explain more, we'll need to look at the alternate 1950s of Fire on the Mountain. Following a successful revolution, the state of Nova Africa is created and eventually adopts socialism. Further Marxist revolutions spread across the globe, and nations like Ireland get their independence earlier. It's even implied that Native American tribes gain independence, and there are preferences to an independent Quebec, suggesting a more balkanized North America. By 1959, the world is completely socialist after a revolution in the United States topples the last capitalist government. Technology is not only incredibly advanced, it is clean, and we are on the verge of landing on Mars. We even have orbital factories that produce living shoes that change their color when you go walking in the rain. Yes, that is something that exists in this timeline. 
There are even airships, because of course there have to be in an alternate history. But considering my car can go faster than our timeline's fastest dirigible, even I don't know why they are in this advanced society. I share this all with you because this is where fire on the mountain gets a little preachy. If you're a true believer in socialism, then yes, this society makes sense to you. But that can be said for any utopian book anywhere on the political spectrum. Consider L. Neil Smith's book, The Probability Brooch. It's a libertarian utopia, where getting rid of a centralized government also creates a more technologically advanced society. If you, however, are more moderate in your political beliefs, then all this is fantasy to you because you can't see the cause and effect. Fire on the Mountain essentially argues that socialism plus question mark equals utopia, and that's not plausible. Things get even preachier when we are introduced to the in universe book John Brown's Body which is an alternate history where Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry fails and history plays out much like it did in our timeline, although it emphasized many of the worst parts of our history, and it is a favorite of the few remaining white nationalists in the United States. It does make a few changes to our history, including the trend of white people eating their own children. I don't know. Don't ask me. It's obvious the message Bison is trying to get across, that racism is bad and socialism can cure all of society's ills. That is a fine message, but when you create such a utopia, people who aren't already predisposed to accept your message are more likely to dismiss it. If you want to win them over, being realistic as possible in your alternate history is your best bet. You want people to think that socialism can help improve society, and being plausible by toning down the sci-fi elements can help because it can make the reader think it is possible. Consider another socialist book like Upson Sinclair's The Jungle. Although remembered more for bringing America's attention to the unsanitary practices in the Chicago stockyards, it spent more time depicting how the corruption among the powerful and wealthy in American society drove the working class into poverty, homelessness, and crime. Near the end, the main character joins the Socialist Party, and while it does get preachy at this point, it does so without the sci-fi elements of Fire on the Mountain. Characters in the jungle discuss how socialism can bring about a better future, instead of just showing the future. In my opinion, it makes socialism as a solution to the country's problems more believable to the reader. Despite all those criticisms, I don't want you to walk away from this review thinking I don't recommend Fire on the Mountain. On the contrary, I really think you should go read it. The writing is gorgeous, the characters are unique with strengths and flaws, the parts after uh, Brown's raid are believable, and even the socialist utopian future isn't offensively bad. More importantly, Fire in the Mountain subverts the usual outcome of American Civil War alternate histories where the Confederacy wins their independence. The South still wins in this timeline, but it's the South of the slaves and not the slaveholders. Considering how derivative most American Civil War alternate histories are, Fire on the Mountain stands out from the pack. Yes, the scenario is implausible, but a lot of dreams can be. Fire on the Mountain captures the dreams of those who fought and died for equality between all Americans. You're not going to read another alternate history book like it, and I highly recommend you check it out. Well, that is all I have to say on this subject. If you like what I do, please comment, subscribe, or support me on Patreon. I'm Matt Mitrovich, the Alternate Historian. Bye!